Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the third episode of the MIT Arab Alumni Association webinar series. Today's webinar is about the economic recovery post COVID-19, and I'm very pleased to have Mr. Samir Khanasha and Mr. Yasser Luwabi with us. Before we begin, some housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and broadcast live. So the recording with subtitles will be available for replay on demand. Uh, we will have a dialogue for the first 45 minutes of the session, and we'll leave the last 15 minutes to answer questions from the audience. For those of you joining us on Zoom, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens, and I'll curate those to our panelists. Again, please use the Q&A, not the chat button. For those joining us live on Facebook or YouTube, please enter your questions as comments there and we'll do our best to get to them. Let me start by introducing myself and our speakers. My name is Anwar Ghosh. I've been the president of the MIT AAA for the last two years, and I'm the founder of Construct 4 a technology startup focused on construction procurement. I hold an MBA from Stanford, a master from MIT, and a bachelor from the American University of Beirut. Our first panelist today is Mr. Samir Khanashat. He is the Group Chief Operating Officer of Kipco, a multi-billion dollar global holding company based in Kuwait. He is also the chair of the Takaout Savings and Pension and a director of the Burjan Bank, United Gulf Bank, and United Real Estate Company. Samir is a member of the Board of Trustees of the American University of Kuwait and a member of the MIT Corporation Development Committee. He holds an MBA from Harvard and two bachelor degrees from MIT. Our second panelist today is Mr. Yasser Zouawi. Yasser is a partner with the consulting firm McKinsey & Company, which he joined in 2005. He heads the Global Competence Center in Economic Development and supports governments in the Middle East and Africa on economic development issues. Since the coronavirus outbreak, Yasser has been leading the Middle East Center for COVID Economic Response. He is a graduate of the ESSEC Business School and holds an MBA from Columbia University. So Yasser, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Uh, please give us a macro view on the current economic situation and a bit about what you're predicting for the eventual recovery. Absolutely. Thanks, Anwar. Thanks, for, uh, thanks to all of you for inviting me. I know I'm not uh, an alum from MIT, but I, I've, uh, I'm, uh, I thank you a lot for welcoming me in this, uh, in this uh, very nice circle. Uh, so um, I just wanted to have maybe five minutes of uh, presentation of, what, uh, of how the economic crisis uh, linked to COVID is hitting the, uh, the, the, the region. And I want to focus maybe more in particular on the, on the GCC for now. Um, so as you all know, the, the shock that, is, that the region is having is not a, a single shock just due to COVID, but a dual shock. So there's a shock from the economic impact of, of obviously the, the shutdowns and uh, the aftermath of the uh, health response, uh, which is you know, shutting down and the, the, the social restrictions from the one hand. And on the other side is an oil, oil shock, uh, which is a, a uh, we'll talk probably more about it uh, later, uh, but it's compounding the effect of uh, the corona uh, virus economic shock and also is preventing the region from actually responding to the virus in its with its full uh, potential and cap uh, capacity so maybe a few thoughts first on on uh, on the on the on the coronavirus globally and how and then maybe a number of uh, you know a few thoughts on how uh, it is hitting differently uh, the region so first of all you know, you you all by now we're all all well read and uh, all aware of, aware of uh, you know how big the shock is. Uh, just a few elements of of a reminder. This is uh, the the biggest you know economic shock we've seen since World War II, probably in the drop of 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 the of the uh, of the shock. Right. Uh, we estimate that uh, for the quarter uh, second quarter of 2020. Uh, the drop would be as much as, uh, you know, 12% approximately uh, of economic drop since uh, Q4 of 2019 for regions like the Eurozone, uh, approximately 10% also for, uh, for uh, the U.S. And, um, and uh, for the full year of 2020, 
uh, the the uh, the economic shock would be uh, as much as five six percent for the whole world uh, in in, uh, in in loss of output. If we compare this to two thousand and nine shock, uh, this is something. Uh, this is something that uh, is in terms of total loss of output uh, from the the start of the crisis to potentially the end, the recovery of the crisis. Uh, this is a shock that might be three to five times the, the, the loss of output of 2009 due to two reasons. One, the drop is much bigger uh, in, in like a 10% drop, as we mentioned, is, is, uh, is unique really, but also because very probably, very likely, the recovery path will, will and we start seeing this uh, with the potential aftermath of, of the virus coming back, uh, you know, on and off for a number of months. Uh, the duration of recovery might even be longer. And so when you compound the depth with the potential in, you know, duration, the surface of loss of output is potentially three to five X of, of what we've seen as a, as a loss in 2009. And this is all the magnitude of the shock. And just a reminder, we were calling the 2009 depression, the Great Depression as being only parallel to the, 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 the shock of the, of the 30th, right? So how different now is this uh, playing out for, is this shock playing out for the region? I think it's playing out differently for linked to some of the characteristics of the region. And this can differ country by country and we might talk about these, uh, but the, the main differences are the first one, as, uh, are the following. First, I think there's an impact that you see. There's an effect from the fact that uh, the, the region here has a, a, a very large part of the economy which is driven by uh, um, state-owned enterprises. So that has two effects. The first effect is a lot of jobs are actually, uh, you know, basically uh, covered and protected by the fact that the, 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 the SOEs and also government in general is, is employing uh, a lot of uh, locals and citizens. Uh, but there's also a, another impact to it, which is that this, uh, in any case, the, 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 these, um, these SOEs will have a drop in their profits. And so their contribution to the fiscal, let's say, uh, you know, government fiscal uh, revenues will uh, will drop obviously a lot, and so it, it is a, a the the fact that there's a SOEs uh, in large numbers in the region has a job protecting effect, but it would worsen basically the uh, the, the 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 fiscal uh, let's say uh, revenues for the government. That's one specificity. Another specificity is a bit of a similar mechanism, which is the you know public workforce public workforce dominated. If you take Saudi Arabia for example. Five million, uh, uh, you know, uh, local workforce of Saudis. Probably seventy-five or eighty percent of them are working with the government. So same thing. There's a cushioning effect, but at the same time, the, you know, the government needs to pay these people, and so there's uh, there's a less capacity to actually fluctuate the the expenses of the government. So again, a transmission to a fiscal hit, right? In, um, absorbing the economic shock. Uh, another uh, another very interesting uh, element is the is the expat workforce. The region has 85% of its labor force, uh, 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 which is expat across the, all the GCC countries. So when you think about it, it has a, a, a um, it can have, if you want, a balancing impact. We're saying, well, we might not need as, as much people, as many people. So at some point, they would be able to return home and so be less of a economic, let's say, uh, you know, if you want to call it uh, with the, the word maybe burden economically to, to support in, in the future. But it also has a negative impact potentially. If you take the example of Dubai, where a lot of the economy is just based to consume from you know consumption, a lot of people leaving would actually you know have a very important drop on 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 commerce and and on retail in general. And so it, it does have a rippling effect on the on the economy. Uh, one of the estimates we have is uh, there's a figure an estimate that we've done is uh, from half a million to a million. Uh, expats could leave in in the in the in the kingdom alone of uh, KSA alone. That 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 is a is a big enough figure to have an actual important impact on the on the economy and and behind it is not only consumption but it's also real estate uh, etc. Um, and so maybe just uh, I don't want to take too much of the of the time uh, of the seven minutes you gave us. Um, but so the. If you want the economic impact, in a sense, is translating into a fiscal fiscal shock. Just to give you a figure, uh, in the in the kingdom, we estimate that between the additional cost of you know the healthcare response, etc., and the drop of oil, and the forfeiting revenues that they will not be collecting this year, 
the kingdom has between four and 500 billion riel of loss of, of uh, collections, if you want, or, or, or gap between what they had planned last year and this year. So this is a substantial shock, right? It's a substantial difference of uh, you know, 400 billion, and that needs to be financed. So all of a sudden, we, we move from an economic impact to a fiscal impact, not, uh, not considering that the government then needs to respond to the crisis by re-injecting actually money in the economy for now during the shutdown to actually hold and freeze the economy as the word has been used, but also we'll need that fiscal stimulus to be able to reboot the economy in a number of weeks or the upcoming month uh, from the depressed, depressed situation we will be. And maybe the final thought is, and maybe Samir can even talk even more about that, the, the region cannot play with all its, its um, it's uh, not only it has an important additional pressure on fiscal, but it cannot play with all of its all of the uh, ammunitions that other countries are playing with, which is, for example, the monetary uh, monetary lever. Uh, it, it is one of the most important lever used in you know OECD countries. But when you look at the consideration of the pegged currencies and the difficulty to actually use monetary as much as they want, uh, the GCC countries find themselves having to rely. Uh, in a much more, much more importantly, on the fiscal, which is already shocked, rather than other tools like uh, monetary. Uh, so this is a bit of the of the of a, a quick, uh, you know, macro picture on on how the the the, the region is, is is feeling differently. The shock, and happy to take questions afterwards. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Yasser, for this comprehensive view. Maybe if we can take a few minutes and hear a bit from you, Samir, about your view, and then we'll start a little bit the dialogue here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, let me, uh, first of all, maybe give some uh, background about KIPCO. Maybe that will drive uh, some of the questions you may have. So KIPCO is a holding company. We have uh, six uh, sectors. We, we, I'm sorry, we concentrate on banking and we have banks in seven countries around the Middle East, North Africa. And uh, unusually for us, because we're very MENA focused, but we're in Turkey and, uh, and Malta. Uh, we control OSN, which I assume most of you know. We control uh, one of the largest private insurance group across the region, again, with operations in nine countries. Our real estate activity is in seven countries in the MENA region. We're also in the industrial manufacturing area in a couple of countries, and the baby in the business is education, which at this point in time is all in Kuwait. So uh, I, I have some familiarity with obviously all of these sectors. Let me also start uh, with a, a warning because I, I think we all live in the same uh, over information bubble and we all hear a lot, too much, I would say. And so the odds of my saying something new is, is probably infinite, infinitesimal. And uh, so I apologize in advance if you heard what I have to say. Um, and again, another couple of warnings up front is um, obviously in, in the position I'm in, trying to figure out what's next, uh, what the future is for these very different uh, businesses is very critical. The, so we, we at Kipco do nothing but collect dividends from these companies and knowing what we're going to collect and when is obviously life and death. And uh, unfortunately, as you all know, uh, when you ask what's next uh, about the pandemic, it's mostly guesses, be it the timing of the vaccine, a second wave, development of immunity, mutation of the, of the, of the virus. These are all still questions for which there are no uh, clear answers. I would also add, uh, given our, ex our exposure in many countries, that each country is different. Even when they appear to be going through the same curve, the reasons behind those curves can be very different. So culture, population age, the political system or regime, the wealth and the, the, the particularly healthcare resources available obviously all play a big role and will affect the outcome, whatever that will be. And then when we come to the economic impact, I'd like to, I, I am going to try to uh, uh, make it clear the fact that 
a large number of the impact is really highlighting and exacerbating existing problems that are now rising up to the surface. In addition to uh, what everybody's calling the new reality, I mean, how, how will we go back to work and, and what will be the changes there? And I, am, I and uh, I assume many others are looking for the super smart people that are able to look at not only at the consequences, but the consequences of the consequences of the consequences to kind of give us a, a sharper view of uh, where the opportunities and the threats will be, not tomorrow, but uh, later on. So uh, as I mentioned, I, I want to go a, a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about where, and I'm going to focus on this region, uh, the GCC in particular, because that's the area I know best. And, uh, and let's talk a little bit about where we were before, I'm sorry, before COVID uh, came upon us. And as you all know, um, we are, and as uh, Yasser just mentioned, we, are, we, are, we all live uh, on oil dependency. And um, most of the countries were already in deficit and those that were not were on their way towards deficit, uh, partly because of oil prices and partly because spending just keeps going up. And, um, and these countries are, are struggling and will continue to struggle with the social pressures of, of a population that's been used to uh, all forms of subsidy and support, which will become increasingly unaffordable. So um, we've known all along, I've, I've been in Kuwait since 1975, so I can tell you that in 1975, uh, there were voices talking about reducing uh, subsidies and controlling costs way back when. And, and the need for, for restructuring and for reform is as critical as it's ever been. And, and maybe this crisis will accelerate a movement towards action, which has been sorely lacking until now. I also would like to, um, I, so um, just to give you a reference, uh, after the invasion of Kuwait, uh, obviously Kuwait was shut down, there were no schools or anything. I moved my family back to the US and then moved back to Kuwait in 07 when, um, uh, um, when actually my youngest uh, kid went to college and we became empty nesters. And uh, so I, I went, came back to Kuwait and was able to catch really the, the height of the boom. And I can tell you, uh, it was an eye-opening uh, uh, period where every chairman of every major bank in the world came knocking at the door of Kipco because we were a, uh, you know, a very large uh, a company in the region. And at the time we had just sold Wataniya Telecom to Qatar what is now redo uh, for the highest price uh, ever achieved for any transaction in the region. So we were on everybody's radar screen and every big name, you know, came knocking at our door. And then the crisis hit. And, um, and the reality, we have been in and out of a crisis ever since. So when from the point of view of the Dow Jones hitting nearly 30,000 in February, Whereas the Kuwaiti stock market barely recovered from the low it hit after the 09 collapse and, and never recovered half of the drop it, it incurred after that collapse. And then, you know, add to that uh, the Arab Spring since 2011, price of oil volatility. So with all the businesses we've been in since 08 and until the beginning of Corona, we were living with volatility, the volatility of the oil price and the impact it has on the economies, uncertainty about where those, those prices were going to go, uh, political uncertainty, social uncertainty, you know, the, the, what are the consequences of governments, for example, trying to curtail uh, subsidies and social support, and then economic uncertainty as well. So let me, uh, I don't want to abuse my time. So let me talk a little bit about oil. And I thought, uh, I told the host, I would take advantage of being, having the podium to, to, to throw something out at you and, and I'll be happy to discuss it more. But um, for somebody who grew up uh, through the 73 oil crisis, 
and, and, a, and a long held belief that any barrel of oil you don't sell today is okay. You keep it in the ground and you'll sell it for a higher price in the future. The reality today is there's more oil out there than will ever be sold. So really keeping, if you don't sell a barrel of oil today, you will never sell it. So it is sell, sell now or never. So, let, and as an example of this, uh, this new paradigm, the, the, the little story of what happened between Saudi Arabia and, and Russia is uh, very emblematic. So I, I believe that knowingly or not, what the way Saudi dealt with it was brilliant because on the one hand, they protected their market share. They have more oil than anyone. They have cheaper oil than anyone. Why should they allow anybody else to sell a barrel of oil that they can sell? And accessorily, but importantly, if you, if you were watching American news in particular, uh, Trump's initial reaction was enormously positive because he's so focused on his re-election, the, the drop of the price of gas at the pump is very important for his electors. It took him five to six days to think about the impact of that collapse of prices on the energy sector. And, uh, and, but in the meantime, the Saudi got a lot of bonus points with Trump and they need his support in, in the world of geopolitics. And then, um, of course, uh, Trump woke up to, to the economic uh, uh, effect and, uh, and, uh, and then there were negotiations to stabilize the price where, where KS, the, the, KS, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was on equal footing with Russia and the US. And I think that is remarkable. So that means that uh, our region, which has the most and the cheapest oil needs to continue investing in capacity so that they will be able to sell their oil and get as much out of the oil they have as they can. And I know Kuwait has announced seven years ago that they were gonna go from three to four and a quarter million barrel. And as far as I know, they could, they're continuing to invest into that. And that's a very smart move. And Saudi also has regularly announced increases in their capacity. So in a sense, that's good news because what it means is we will be the last region in the world selling the last drop of oil. And until that day, there will be revenue gener uh, generation to this region, maybe not enough to cover the budgets and the needs. And we're gonna have to go through belt tightening. And, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, restructuring and, and, um, and reform, but we will have that revenue. I will make a little, a little another aside, you know, in a, for, for Russia, to sell uh, oil at $20 when it costs them $40 to produce it, you have to think that they're printing rubles, uh, uh, well, $40 equivalent of rubles to produce that oil to collect the foreign currency they need for all the equipment and technology and what else that they require for their economy. So uh, when the press was focusing on the fact that uh, 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 Russia was sitting on 500 billion of reserves. That is, that is not the entire story because they were bleeding, uh, uh, you know, through devaluation of the currency uh, uh, to, to be in, in that position. And it's not a, a, a sustainable position. And, and all that to say that going forward, the Gulf will continue to be able to sell oil. We can be very, very competitive. There will be a volatility because demand can collapse instantly the way it just did a couple of months ago. Whereas supply takes a long, much longer time to come online. And so there will be moments of shortages and, and moments of surplus and that will continue. So I, I don't expect short of a war like a, a US Iran war for hundred dollar prices, but, but you, can, you will see uh, the price of oil gyrating between 20 and $50 I suspect for the coming years. Let me jump to banking quickly. Um, obviously, I know the Kuwait market best, and, but we have banks in, in other countries in the region. Um, I, I think the performance of the banks will be very much determined by what the central banks, each of those countries' central banks does in terms of support. If I take the, the, uh, the banks in this region are, by the way, strong. They're very highly capitalized by world standards. So they're in, in, in pretty good 
<clears throat> pretty good shape to absorb the hits of, of this uh, economic uh, crisis. Uh, of course, if it doesn't last too long. But given that uh, you know, real estate is a major, major uh, segment in all of these countries, and the banks are heavily exposed to that sector, uh, how the real estate sector does, and I'll talk about that next, uh, will have obviously a, a very uh, a critical impact on bank performance. Nonetheless, uh, the banks in this region, particularly in Saudi and Kuwait and Qatar, are protected by rules from foreign competition. So, um, and that's, uh, that helps them being strong. That is not a sustainable uh, situation. So, barring those uh, protective rules, we have too many banks in the region and they are gonna have to consolidate and to, to, to gain economies of scale and reduce costs and be able to compete with the international uh, uh, competition. And, and we have the additional uh, uh, challenge here of conve conventional banks uh, competing with Islamic banks. Uh, Islamic banks in Kuwait at this moment are in the process of becoming larger than the conventional banks from being non-existent 30 years ago. So that's a pretty remarkable achievement. Um, and again, I, 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 I throw all that out so that you can have questions to ask. Then we talk about real estate and uh, real estate as well did not have a very happy last 10 years, uh, be it in the Gulf or be it uh, across Middle East, North Africa. And, uh, and we started the year uh, uh, with a struggle before even thinking that uh, the pandemic was, was coming. Um, and again, that ties to the price of oil, the, the revenues of the government and their ability to pump money into the economy. Uh, in the case of Kuwait, the private sector is probably somewhere around 20% of the overall economy. So it's not very important, but it certainly screams very loudly and, and, and obviously has a political voice. So um, the, the, we'll have to see how the government responds to the fact that uh, 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 we will have, we, we are now, we will close now on three months of shutdown. And given the numbers of new cases that are still coming here, we will probably see an extension of that. And obviously that hits uh, the bottom line very, very dramatically. So uh, our real estate company will definitely show losses this year. And it's really going to be a matter of degree. And that depends on how quickly the government allows the economy to return. But it also depends on people's behavior. So there's a there's a there's a, a people aspect, and will people be willing to go to the mall, you know, and under what circumstances? Um, but uh, the the what we see is our real estate is being hit on the income side, on the valuation side, and that hits on the loans we have that are sometimes collateralized with the value of the real estate. The recovery time, the, how long it takes to start coming back, and of course the financial leverage that is in place, which, which obviously uh, puts a burden of um, of interest cost on it. The interest rates have come down, but not as dramatically as in the U.S. So it is still a burden um, uh, on on the company. Uh, finally, if I had to um, uh, uh, mention what we at the holding level are, are hammering our CEOs with is look, going forward is, you know, cash is king, control costs in every possible way, uh, agi agility, you know, uh, uh, don't, don't get stuck in, in, a, in whatever model you have in your head. You know, uh, we, we are playing a survival game. And, uh, and finally, the, the threat of the digitalization and, and actually the, the need to move towards that in, across all of our businesses it has been dramatized by this uh, pandemic. You know. And uh, to a comment that Yasser made earlier uh, about uh, currencies and the problem of the pegging of our currency, the Kuwaiti dinar has already been devalued by 3%. So we are not pegged to a dollar, we're pegged to a basket, so there's a little bit of flexibility and, uh, and one way to, to reduce costs is to devalue the currency. And that has already started and I suspect it will continue. 
I'm done. I probably overshot my time, but sorry about that. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Samir, for the for the very thought-provoking comments. You can already see the number of questions coming in our Q and A. So for everybody in the audience, please keep them coming. Uh, we'll address those towards the end, but uh, we definitely want to hear more about uh, your reactions and, and any questions you have for, for these uh, initial comments. Um, maybe at this point, I'll start a little bit with the with the macro level. So yes, sir, this, this question is a bit more for you. Um, typically experts categorize crises as either being event-driven or structural. And so this one certainly started as a, as a clear event-driven one, but the worry and the concern now is that it's evolving into more of a structural one with the amount of unemployment rising so sharply. Um, I know you already touched a little bit on the nature of, uh, uh, of the employment market in, in, the, in the Gulf, but maybe you can comment a bit more on that. Very good. Indeed, it's very it's very hard to talk about unemployment levels in, in the region uh, because of the uh, you know over or very large reliance on uh, on expat uh, labor at all levels. Uh, and so, what we then see, what the impact that it then has is fluctuations of of inhabitants and fluctuations of the labor force. So that that if we think about it, would have a couple of impacts. Uh, one, which is a we we mentioned it quickly, which is a consumption impact. And, uh, and again, uh, I, I don't want to, uh, to, um, to minimize this. Uh, we can, you know, we're talking potentially about, you know, a million people in just one country. Uh, in, the, in the region, it could be easily two to two and a, two and a half or three million uh, uh, people leaving actually the, the, the region. So that, that is one important impact that, that touches business, businesses as simple as, you know, uh, food processing, uh, you know, uh, retails, et cetera, right? Uh, and we talk about real estate, et cetera. So that's one impact. But if we talk about the labor force, uh, the type of impact it could have on the labor force is, is quite uh, structural and, uh, and can bring a number of, of changes uh, to the region that are potentially to the benefit of the region, right? Already before the crisis, uh, if we take the, an example of, uh, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, which had approximately eight, eight to nine million, uh, let's say expats, let's say three years ago, uh, we've already seen, uh, you know, a drop, uh, you know, year after year of the number of expats to reach something like around 7 million. I don't have the exact figure just before the crisis. Um, what we would could potentially see is a further drop. So that further drop would have a couple of impacts. The first one is, you know, these job opportunities will have to be replaced somehow. So they will either be replaced by increased automation or increased digital, let's say, services. So higher productivity, basically, for the companies in the region. So that's one element that we could see more and more going forward. And, you know, Samir talked about the digital channels as being a risk, but digital channels are unmanned. <laughs> and so you, you, you would need, the, you would see this, the, this sort of a transformation of the labor force. One other element you could see is a larger participation of uh, women, for example, to the labor force, right? To, to sort of replace little by little. This is, has been planned for a long time. And this was a sort of a natural, uh, let's say movement from expats to more participation of, of, uh, of the population, particularly uh, you know, women uh, labor. So you might see that as being accelerated. Uh, a third phenomenon you, you, you would see is a shift from, uh, the, from jobs in the private sector, in the, in the public sector and in the uh, and in, uh, state owned enterprises more and more towards the private sector. Uh, again, we mentioned it just before, 80% probably of, uh, of uh, Saudis, just as one example, if and probably almost uh, similar figures for inhabitants of, uh, of, uh, of the other, let's say, Gulf states are, are in the public sector. And so more and more you will need, you will see this attraction towards, uh, let's say, the public sector work, which is in line with the fact that the government need also to, uh, to ease basically the, the pressure on, on, uh, on, their, on their budget. And so less and less, uh, you know, employees might be also a way uh, that basically benefits the, the, the whole, uh, the, both the, you know, both the fiscal side of the government, but also the, the, the transformation of the labor, labor force. So I'll just stop there for, uh, on this one. No, that, that, that's great. And I, I really like that line around the, um, the, the how the expat population uh, has a particular impact on the region. It, it, it highlights kind of the, the contagion 
uh, effect, not just from the coronavirus itself, but also from the global trade perspective. Uh, so maybe you can comment a bit more on what you're seeing from the impact of the drop in global trade. So are you expecting this to pick up again in the same way and soon? Or are you thinking more that it will pick up again, but there will be some new, uh, some new routes that might uh, come online, but especially with what we're hearing about onshoring from the US these days. Uh, and if you don't think that these new, new routes will come back, are you expecting something else to try to compensate for those? No, no absolutely. I think this is a very good question. And uh, but the reality is that the, let's say the low level of um, exposure of these countries to uh, global trade is a bit different. If you take, for example, Dubai as an emirate, not the whole UAE, Dubai as an emirate is probably the, the most, uh, certainly actually the most impacted by, by global trade. And by global trade, I want to enlarge this and just talk about global flows. We're talking about people flows, tourism, right? Hajj al Umrah is also a people flow. It's a, it's a, it's a globalization flow of people, right? Uh, you, know, you have the, the traditional trade flows and uh, industrial capital flows, et cetera. So let's talk about flows in general. Uh, Dubai will be the most impacted, uh, definitely. Uh, we, we see that already. Uh, the, the number of people leaving actually the, the country is, is very important uh, because of the uh, drop in, 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 uh, in flows activity, right? The airport is one of the largest, was larger, one of the largest contributors, just 100,000 people, just between the airlines and the airport, um, catering for something like uh, 17, 18 million tourists per year. This amount of, of uh, this number of tourism with their spend is probably going to be fully lost this year. And we will not recoup that until maybe a couple of years, if not three years, if not more. And so this is a, you know, a dramatic exposure of uh, an emirate like Dubai. If you take other, uh, uh, the, you know, other countries, the exposure is much, much less to, to global flows. You typically would have, you know, pockets. It's either... Uh, you know, uh, some exports like, uh, you know, basic material plus the downstream oil, et cetera, et cetera, which will obviously drop a little bit, but will come back after the, you know, the general sort of increase in, uh, in, uh, in the global economy. Um, where you have other pockets of, uh, I mentioned Hajj and Omar, this is an important one. Again, it's millions of people coming every year to the kingdom with their spend, et cetera. And this is all lost opportunity economically. Uh, so that's an important uh, aspect. You mentioned the supply chain, uh, you know, localizations. Um, this has, you know, I, I see here two potential, uh, you know, effects. One is a from the countries in the region, a a, a uh, you know higher consciousness of the fact that they need to own, uh, let's say, uh, more parts of the global supply chains on strategic products. So we could talk about some pharma products, some uh, some. Um, uh, you know, medical equipment, uh, you know, we know, for example, that there's a number of companies that launched just for on masks, etc. Uh, just in the aftermath of, uh, of the crisis during the, the, the health crisis. So you might see more of that, including the food supply chain, etc. So that is one element which, you know, is economically interesting, uh, localizing, increased localization. On the other, uh, on other uh, type of supply chains, if you take uh, maybe, you know, more advanced, uh, you know, ma manufacturing, you know, equipment, uh, here, you, you might see uh, the, the opposite effect, uh, because a lot of these localizations or, or, or the, uh, what you mentioned is, you know, uh, investments in these supply chains in the region uh, would be linked, uh, would be also um, induced by international investments, by FDIs. Um, a large part of them would come, these localizations would come through FDIs. And uh, it, it, is, it seems more and more clear that FDIs is going to be an important shock uh, they, they're going to drop, let's say, in, in an important way uh, globally going forward. And so uh, unless you have basically the, the, the local private sector, you know, uh, you know uh, rising up to the challenge and uh, maybe finding partnerships or actually stretching itself to, to make the appropriate investments in these supply chains, you, you might have actually much less than, than what you could have with the, uh, with the FDIs. So again, uh, a, a mixed picture by, you know, type of flow by country. Uh, but also by 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 supply chain. But generally, it's a it's a it's not a let's say the most favorable uh, uh, picture uh, for the region. That makes sense. Uh, maybe I can switch the conversation back to you, Samir, on on that uh, on that point. You already talked a little bit about the the kind of double whammy that we're seeing uh, um, with with the 
GCC uh, oil producing countries kind of suffering from their own drop in, uh, in, in GDP, but also being affected by the drop in uh, GDP from the, from the uh, oil consuming countries. And so can you comment a little bit more about that and, and what you're expecting in terms of not just the, the price of oil, which you already alluded to, it's going to be a little bit range bound between 20 and 50, but maybe kind of how the governments uh, in, the, in the region are dealing with this. And so do they need to be even more aggressive on a number of fronts or should they focus on the oil itself? How do, how do you think a little bit about that? Um, good question. Um, a trillion dollar question. Um, so I, I, th I think, uh, unfortunately, the, the governments have to fight on all fronts. So uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, back in 1975, some of the forward-looking people in Kuwait, Kuwaitis in Kuwait were questioning the, the long, uh, the sustainability, long-term sustainability of some of the uh, subsidies and, and various policies that the government was putting in place to distribute the wealth you know, uh, of oil that was beginning to come in, in big numbers at that time. Um, the solution is certainly a, a large number of solutions that can dramatically reduce the deficit have been known all along. Cut your um, uh, uh, electricity subsidy, cut your water subsidy, cut your, uh, don't cut the health care subsidy, but uh, charge some symbolic amount to, 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 to have people appreciate the value of what they're getting. The um, one of the more flagrant costs is uh, uh, the, the cost that a Kuwaiti pays to bring in an expat, so the, the cost of an economy, the cost of a residency, is a small fraction of the shadow cost of that expatriate on the economy. So we're talking about road costs, electricity costs, water costs, transportation, healthcare. You accumulate all of that. And back in 1975, where I was part of a a study to try to estimate what that shadow cost was. It was at the time eight to ten times the cost of getting that that residency for a foreigner. That gap, if anything, has only widened. The, the, the shadow cost has gone up multiple times and much more than the the actual cost of getting a, a residency today. So the, the true cost of that expatriate population, and obviously it has connections to what you were talking about, about the, the expat population and how, how much can we, how much can we have and how, for how long, if, if that is incorporated in, in, the, in the calculations, you, you can make dramatic uh, impact on, on the deficits, so you start balancing. But these are all very, very difficult social political decisions to make. You know, and uh, the fear of having mass uh, reaction to cut back of benefits uh, is, is obviously the, the counter pull, right? The pull is, is financial and the counter pull is political and social. But I, I, I think if, if the, the crisis is real and sustained, then people will have to and will be much more willing to accept. You know? They're not gonna be willing to accept when they hear that the government is still accumulating surpluses and, uh, you know, and, and doesn't see a, a real need to do anything now. Why should they suffer when, when it doesn't look, when it may not look as if it's necessary, you know, when this necessity is years in the future. If this brings about a, a sustained circumstance where the government can clearly explain and justify what they're doing, maybe then we'll get on, a, on, a, on the right path. But as I said, at least we have the benefit of being the last countries to earn any money from oil. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, there are studies that show that, uh, I mean, you know, the, the most uh, optimistic for alternatives is that by, 19, by 2025, you will have a 20 plus percent the dent in the fossil fuel use. The IEA, I think, um, puts that for 2030. 
So obviously, the, the, the further out it is, the more time the countries have to adjust and adapt and invest in, in, um, in you know, alternative sectors and, and diversification. Makes sense. Makes sense. So I mean, against this backdrop, I, I think the next question becomes, what are governments most likely to do for the oil producing countries now? Are they going to try to inject some, some infrastructure packages to try to stimulate the economy? And what's kind of the impact on, uh, on the inflation uh, and the interest rates in, the, in these countries? And, and by the way, let's, I think this is a good time to start opening up uh, the, the, the questions from the audience. So uh, after this question, we'll start opening it up. So this is addressed to who? To either of you who would like to take it. Uh, and then we, I'll, I'll do one minute and then, yeah, so you probably. This is you know, your domain, no, Sammy. Well, no, I don't know. But, um, well, you know, Saudi has already announced the tripling of the VAT. Um, and uh, they have uh, attempted a number of other measures in the past. Some were advanced and then withdrawn to try to reduce uh, subsidies, the different forms of subsidies and payments to, to Saudi employees and so on. And they will continue to do that. Let, but let me make, uh, I, 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 let me pay a compliment to Saudi Arabia. I mean, when I, when I first went back to Kuwait, uh, Kuwait was way ahead uh, uh, of the other uh, Gulf uh, OPEC countries in terms of uh, investing in refineries and that more downstream refineries. Then we bought uh, Santa Fe, and then we bought, uh, if I remember correctly, we bought the Shell Oil Company refinery and gas stations in Northern Europe. So we were way ahead of, of the rest of the GCC in terms of diversification and going downstream and so on. And then we went to sleep. So today, um, I may be a little bit off on the number, but 80% of Kuwaiti revenue are oil dependent. In Saudi, in, Syria, in Saudi Arabia today, that number is down to 55 or 60%. So you've got to give them credit that they, they actually have put their money where their mouth is and they've invested, be it in GE plastics or in much more further down, uh, uh, downstream diversification uh, in, within their own infrastructure in terms of, you know, going further down the downstream route uh, for their oil. So they've gone a long way. They have a long way to go, but uh, they've, done, they've done, I think, a remarkable job. And Kuwait needs, and some of the other Gulf I need to wake up and follow suit as well so that we retain more of the value add of oil, you know, as it goes down the, the downstream route. I don't know if that answers all the questions, but... Uh, it answers the first part, and I think Yasser can continue on how that impacts the... By the way, to tell you one thing that was announced today, which I thought was interesting. So when you employ, you employ you pay a tax. A tax is then turned around into in Arabic, so every Kuwaiti employee I have gets a salary from the government over and above the salary that I pay him. And that's an incentive for him to leave the government and work for the private sector. Today, the government will pay us uh, that, an equivalent of that amount. So they will pay the Dam Amala to the employee and they'll pay me that amount to make sure that I don't fire him and keep him employed. So they're doing the reverse of taxation. They're actually uh, trying to make sure that uh, that we do not, uh, or the private sector does not fire Kuwaitis, but keeps them employed until things stabilize and, and start improving. Um, so I, I don't think Kuwait is quite ready for taxation yet. They talk about it, but it's, it would be, I think, politically uh, quite difficult. Thank you. Yes, sir. Do you want to continue on, on that line, especially with the deficits being uh, actually on, on the rise? Maybe it would be interesting to, to hear for how long the government can continue on these uh, stimulus uh, efforts. So, so to, to reformulate the question, it's um, what can we expect in terms of uh, you know increase of taxation going forward? Is that is that it? Is that the question? Partly taxation, and the other part is like what's going to happen, for example, with the 
So in, in interest rates, I think Sam is the banker, and with uh, I wouldn't venture into uh, <laughs> into talking about that. But the uh, no, uh, no, the taxation, and there was a question on that also that I answered by you know on a written form. That I'm happy to 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 contribute to also. Uh, you know, very clearly, uh, we'll see more and more uh, taxes on the economy actually uh, you know being uh, brought forward in the region. Uh, for I mean, first of all, it was a trend and a necessity, not just a trend. Uh, and it has started with the VAT a, few, a couple of years ago, and it will progress. Uh, now, it's a necessi necessity also because of uh, the fluctuation nature of oil prices. And so it has an impact on uh, fluctuation of, of, uh, of, um, of the, uh, obviously, of the, uh, of the budget, right? And so introducing these taxes is, a, is introducing resilience into government budget and stability. That resilience and stability will then lead actually governments to be able to, to raise more debt, right? And uh, today the you know debt levels are extremely low, sovereign debt. I think in, in the kingdom it's around 25, 27%. Um, you look at OECD countries where more about 80. So there is a capacity there to do much more, but to do that, you need to have revenue streams that are very stable. And so transforming basically an oil stream, which is uh, you know unstable in its nature, uh, in, into uh, streams that are linked to the economy itself, which is much more resilient in general, much more stable, is actually a very important step to be able to transform the fiscal, let's say, uh, let's say structure of the economy. And uh, so, yes, I think you should, we, we should expect for the better <laughs> increases of uh, taxes in the region. Interesting. So are you also expecting a push for more diversification these days? As the kind of the price of oil goes down, do you feel that the, gov the, the regional governments are going to focus even more on diversification away from oil, or is that kind of the moment where they they focus on the area that they know best and, and try to really play that game? So, so the the I I don't think there is an increased need of diversification of the economy now. I think the need was felt extremely well, uh, you know, from a number of years ago. The necessity is known, right, uh, and, and so. The, it's not about um, it, do, do we need more diversi diversification, it's about is it more or less feasible now than before, right? I would say that two, three years ago, economic conditions were much better, FDIs were flowing, uh, you know, uh, much, uh, you know, uh, in, in a greater numbers. And so those conditions would be, you know, easier for actually diversification that requires the know-how and, and the and, uh, and, uh, capital that comes from FDIs. Uh, I think this period now, and for, for probably for the next two, three years, uh, this source is going to dry out a lot, as mentioned a bit earlier. And so it will just make it more difficult. Now, more difficult doesn't make it impossible. It just means that there's uh, another way of doing this that we need to uh, that, that diversify. For example, we could very much consider you know, new partnerships between the private sector, local private sector and governments to say, well, we want to actually you know, push a specific sector or specific industry with with partnerships like that. A bit, uh, a, a what we've seen in, in uh, you know other countries, uh, you know, decades ago, right? Uh, but so so I'm, I'm saying the con the necessity is still there, not much more than before. Uh, it will be more difficult, but it's not. It doesn't mean that it's not possible to actually double down on on diversification. Great, thank you. Uh, one of the questions that that. Uh stood out a little bit in the, in the Q&A um, is around the impact of uh, the, the, the potential shortage in rent payments on the mortgages and, and how that is impacting the liquidity of banks and whether uh, governments are intervening to, to support that particular sector. Maybe Samir, you wanna take that one? Yeah. Um... So I, in the case of Kuwait, the government has uh, taken steps to make uh, liquidity available. They've reduced uh, the reserve requirements of the banks, right? So they've loosened a little bit um, uh, the, the, the restrictions on, 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 on leverage. And they've made, uh, they've asked the government institutions to make cash available in the system rather than take it out, for example. So absolutely. But the but the the, bank, the central bank has not done yet in, in, is announced any way to help absorb any of those losses. So they've asked right now they've asked the banks to be supportive to postpone interest payments uh, and principal repayments 
uh, until September right now, and they may ask for further extension, but everything is being done uh, on the back of the banks right now in Kuwait. I think in Saudi Arabia, the government has been a little bit more flexible and more generous maybe uh, in terms of, uh, of how to support the banking system. Remembering that the banking system in Saudi Arabia is probably much more critical to the stability of the state, right? I mean, a lot of the borrowings of the government is held by the banks. Uh, in Kuwait, the government doesn't need the banks. They have 500 billion in, in their sovereign wealth fund, right? And the banks are there to really support the private sector and not, not, not the government or the government part of the economy, the oil part of the economy. So very different dynamics. And again, so back to what I said, if every country is very different. You have to really look into the, the specifics, the structures, the rules, the financial conditions of each country, and, and then see what they're doing or whether what they're doing is sufficient or not, you know, helpful or not. No, no, gener no generalities here at all. Makes sense, makes sense. Um... Maybe I'll, I'll ask this last question to kind of uh, from from the audience to both of you. Um, it's a question about cl the climate change discussion. This is something that uh, has maybe taken a little bit of a back burner uh, position uh, with the with the current crisis. Do you do you expect this to continue or not necessarily? Yeah, so you want to go ahead? I'm, I'm sorry, I was answering a question in parallel to, uh, yeah, to yeah. try to, uh, to give some answers. The question is just about climate change. Are you expecting this to stay on the back burner or do you expect this to you know, resurface as a, as a back burner? So I think there's an opportunity uh, there uh, for, I mean, we don't know exactly what, what would happen there, but there's an opportunity. I think that. Um, uh, this crisis with the virus, uh, this virus is a tail event, let's say. And so this crisis is showing that tail events are real. And when they're real, they have real impact. Uh, we're all sitting home, uh, you know, uh, witnessing and, and, and uh, you know, facing that impact. And so climate change is, a lot of people are considering it as a, as a tail event. I mean, I'm, just, it, it, I'm not saying it is, but a lot of people are considering, the deniers are considering the tail event. Now, tail events are true. Uh, so there will probably be a, a, a much higher consciousness of basically, you know, um, uh, caring about, you know, the environment and trying to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to work against its, uh, its impact and mitigation. That's one. The, the, the second, activity, actually, I think, thing which is interesting here is that let's talk about the recovery and how the economic recovery would work. Typically, you would see, you would see this working through uh, major demand stimulation. This demand stimulation can come through uh, you know, you know, government infrastructure or or uh, or uh, private sector investing in large infrastructures as new technologies uh, like 5G, for example, we're thinking about could be a one of the stimulation, etc. Uh, but but then the green stimulation is is a very important one because if there are um, important needs that we know of of a green infrastructure, let's actually uh, do both at the same time, which is build a, a greener future. But at the same time, do it now uh, to actually stimulate the, the, the economy by injecting basically government spend and, 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 uh, and company spend. Uh, so that, this could be, let's say, the, the two dynamics that uh, we'll see here. But I'm not very deep in the topic, but uh, uh, that's what we can expect. Yeah. Understood. And, and I think we're not going to have the time to answer all of the questions in the Q&A. So I just want to take this opportunity at this stage to, to, to thank both of you for taking the time to... to to come on this panel and to address our audience uh, and to everybody in the audience uh, really thank you so much for joining in uh, today there's going to be uh, an announcement about an upcoming uh, webinar in uh, on june the third and we'll check all of that uh, as it comes so thank you all for tuning in today um, thanks again and and hope to see you on the next one thank you Anwar, for having us it's a pleasure thanks for joining us and for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.